Things are not going well. The Black Tower is nearing completion in the past. Terrible things will happen if you don't hurry. I hear an essence echoing from the peaks northwest of Lina City. Can you go? This is Legendary Adventures Podcast, a Legend of Zelda playthrough podcast. This week in Oracle of Ages, we're making a new animal friend, getting a strange flute, making some trades, and saving Symmetry City in order to gain access to the Skull Dungeon. We exit Moonlit Grotto back into the sunlight on Crescent Island. We need to make our way back to the mainland. Just north of the dungeon, we come across an unusual sight. A large red Dodongo lays sprawled out on the beach. Two Tokay stand over it. This huge fish washed ashore, one exclaims. It looks fresh and tasty. The Dodongo cries in distress. We intervene. Speaking to the Tokay, they notice the ember seeds in Leek's satchel. They offer to trade the fish for the ember seeds. Naturally, we make the trade. The Tokay immediately eat the seeds and then run off as their mouths literally ignite into flames. Now those are some spicy seeds. Speaking to the now safe Dodongo, it introduces itself as Dimitri. Yes, it can talk. Dimitri offers to give Link a ride. Dimitri is the third and final animal buddy in the game. We met the other two, Moosh and Ricky, in the last episode. Dimitri has the ability to swim. He's such a strong swimmer, he can even scale waterfalls. He can also eat just about anything we can slash with our sword. We don't get to admire his skills too much at this point, however. Like Ricky before him, and likely Moosh as well, Dimitri will not swim beyond a set area. Here this area includes the coast of Crescent Island, and the path north to the mainland. We can follow the coast of the island east to a patch of soft soil and plant a Gasha seed. It's located on a small island where the Tokay shop was in the past. We then return north and say goodbye to Dimitri for now. Let's take a moment to talk about a few trades and side activities I completed before continuing on. Just outside Lena City to the west, and to the west of an open drawbridge, we find the Happy Mask Shop. I knew where the shop was because I explored earlier in the game. The Happy Mask salesman is behind the counter. He rapidly switches between his usual smiling self and his angry self as he speaks, likely a nod to his erratic behavior in Majora's Mask. The salesman angrily complains he is so hungry his stomach hurts. We give him the tasty meat we acquired from the Tokay chef in the last episode. He gobbles it up and begrudgingly gives Link the doggy mask in exchange. Back in Lena City, a house sits on the west bank of the river. It's up against the back of the Black Tower. This is the home of Mamu Yan. She is a dog breeder and believes that her dog could outperform others in a dog show. The only trouble is, her dog's incredibly shy. She notices the doggy mask and says it'll be just the right thing for her pup. She trades for the mask and gives Link a single dumbbell in return. She claims she only ever had one. Before continuing on, I decided to pay a visit to Tingle. We needed the help of Ricky to reach him the first time, but with the seed shooter in hand, we can hit a switch and extend a bridge allowing us to reach him on our own. Tingle is impressed by how many mystical seed Link has gathered. He uses his fairy magic to expand the capacity of Link's seed satchel. We can now carry up to 50 of each seed. Nice! Now let's get back to the path of the dungeon. The game doesn't make it clear, but at this point we actually pick an animal buddy that we will have accompany us for the rest of our journey. The actions we take next will determine which buddy we take with us. Depending on the buddy we pick, the map layout and the gameplay will change. For my full playthrough of the game, I went with Dimitri. In the shop in Lena City, there is now a strange flute for sale. I knew from my previous playthrough of Oracle of Seasons that these flutes are used to call an animal buddy. The game does not specify which buddy this flute will call. Before buying, I created a suspend point so I could check out how the next segment played out for all three animal buddies. I then bought the flute. It costs 150 rupees, just about cleaning me out. Again, buying this flute locks us into a path where Dimitri will become our companion. If we want Moosh, we need to proceed up the mountain without acquiring the flute. I had to look in a walkthrough to figure out how to get Ricky, and it turns out we need to travel to the past. In Lina Village, in roughly the same area where Vasu Jeweler sits in the present, we find a minigame shop. It's sort of like a batting cage game. A machine shoots balls towards Link, and we must hit them back to destroy targets. 
If we finish the game with more than 50 points, we get Ricky's Flute. Our choice made, we head towards the mountains northwest of Lena City. There's an open drawbridge near the Happy Mash Shop which blocks the path forward. The controls to close the bridge so that we can cross are on the opposite bank of the river behind a small tree. Rocks in the river prevent us from just swimming across. Using the seed shooter and ember seeds, we can burn away the tree and flip the switch. As we follow the path toward the mountain, four screens in, we will find rough terrain that matches the abilities of our chosen animal buddy. This area of rough terrain is known as the Noon Highlands. If we pick Dimitri, the area is flooded and features many waterfalls and strong currents that prevent us traveling far in the highlands without him. If we picked Moosh, the area is pockmarked with holes. If we picked Ricky, the entrance to the Noon Highlands isn't rough at all, there's just a few bushes, but further in we will find cliffs that can only be scaled with Ricky, and some minor holes and obstacles to cross. Just north of the entrance to Noon Highlands we find the head carpenter from Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. He stands next to an incomplete bridge. The poacher saw from Ocarina of Time sits on a box next to him, a clear nod to that game, and the broken bridge in Gerudo Valley. The carpenter complains that his workers are lazy, they're taking a break, but he says the terrain is too rough to reach his workers without some assistance. Because we can't take the bridge or navigate the train alone, we head back the way we came. As we do, a stray fairy from the fairy's woods appears. It asks Link for help. An animal, with a description clearly matching our selected animal buddy, is stuck in the forest after the fairies played a trick on it and it can't get out. We return to the forest. It's mixed up like it was the first time we encountered the fairies on our way to Wing Dungeon. Our animal buddy is found in the same section as the fairy who hid under the rock on our first visit. I found this area to be the hardest to find on my first visit. We need to head up from the central area where the three fairies gather, immediately double back and head down, and then immediately double back and head up again. When we find our animal buddy, the fairies transport us out of the woods. Dimitri promises to come if we play the flute we bought. Ricky promises to come to the flute that Link won in the minigame. And Moosh will give Link a flute to summon him. We take a ride on our animal of choice. Speaking to the carpenter again, he will ask us to track down his workers. We navigate the Noon Highlands using the specific abilities of our animal buddies. Talking to each of the three carpenters who are on a break, they will return to the job as soon as we finish talking to them. Once we round up all three carpenters, we return to the bridge, and they complete it before heading out on another job. We can now proceed up the mountains to the ruins of Symmetry City. It's worth noting that this is the final area where the animal buddy will be required within Oracle of Ages. We never have to use the buddy again within this game if we don't want to. I was surprised by this. I did try calling Dimitri, my chosen buddy, later in the playthrough, but I found out pretty quickly that only Link could travel through the area that I was in. However, the companion we choose will carry over into a linked game, so for me, Dimitri will be automatically selected to help me through my playthrough of Oracle of Seasons. Symmetry City is a ruin which sits atop the Talus Peaks. The entire area is bathed in red. Buildings are all partially collapsed, and creatures made of fire spring from the ground. It's not hard to see what destroyed the village. There are bubbling pools of lava scattered around, and on the north end of Symmetry City, right in the center, there is an active volcano with lava continuously spewing out of it. Opposite of the volcano, on the southern end of the ruined city, we find a mystical seed tree. It holds gale seeds. Gale seeds are keys to the game's fast travel system. By using the seed satchel, we can toss the seeds at Link's feet. He gets swept up in a whirlwind and is able to travel to any mystical seed tree he finds in Labrina. Using Gale Seeds on enemies with the Seed Shooter causes the Whirlwind to sweep them away. Fast traveling with a Whirlwind is a clear nod to the original game, even if the function of the Gale Seeds is different. When Link played the flute in the original game, a Whirlwind swept him up and carried him to a dungeon based on which direction he was facing. On either side of the Gale Tree there are portals to the past. Playing the Song of Echoes, we travel to the past. 
We find Symmetry City was still standing 400 years ago, but it won't be for long. In place of the Gale Seed Tree, there's a large building. Inside we meet two sisters, who explain that Symmetry City must be in balance. Every person, building, or object has to have something mirror it on the other side. In the center of the large building sits the city's symbol, known as the Tuni Nut. The only problem is, it's broken. The sisters say their problems seem to be tied to the construction of the Black Tower in Lena Village. They ask Link for help getting the nut repaired. If it's not repaired, the volcano will destroy the city. There is a man named Patched who can make the repair, but he's not easy to reach. We're told one of the sisters' husbands has the nut, but due to an injury he's unable to climb the nearby cliff known as Restoration Wall to reach Patch. In the basement of this large building we find a man with a large cheesy mustache standing in the center, keeping things in balance through his position. He wishes to work out and get in shape in order to get girls. But he has only one dumbbell, meaning his workouts won't be in balance. We give him the dumbbell we got from Mamu Yan. In exchange, he rips the cheesy mustache from his face and gives it to us. Weird. We find the man with the tuning nut in a building on the upper left side of Symmetry City. On the lower left, we find the path to the restoration wall. A peak neighboring the one that Symmetry City sits on is flooded. We can dive into a patch of water deep enough to swim in, and then move through a side-scrolling area to find the home of a composer, Toki. He's working on a song that will allow one to move forward in time, but he needs a little inspiration to complete it. We play the Song of Echoes to give him the needed inspiration. It works. He teaches us the Song of Currents. With this song, we can travel forward from the past at nearly any point on the map. It's an echo to the magic mirror from A Link to the Past. In that game, we used portals to reach the dark world, but we could travel back to the light world by using the magic mirror. A temporary portal would be placed in the spot we arrived in the light world. At this point in the game, we can only travel to the past through portals, but we can now travel forward with the song, and a temporary portal will be placed at the location where we traveled forward. We proceed down the mountain using the portals and the song of currents to bypass obstacles. We move a seed in the past to create a vine to climb on in the future, and this is the spot where I got stuck for a bit. There's a red stone that's roughly pyramid shaped. It cannot be pushed from left to right. We can pass through a cave to reach the other side of the stone, but we aren't able to move up the mountain from there. The path forward is blocked by a large field of holes. Moosh wasn't my animal bunny, so it's not like I could call him to get over the holes. I didn't think to push that red rock from right to left after pushing it from the other side failed, which meant I was stuck with no way to move forward. After a while of trying different things and even getting some suggestions from my daughter, I broke down and looked at a walkthrough and discovered that that red rock will move from the right to the left. Doing so reroutes the flow of water in the area to cover the holes, allowing us to swim across and move on to the restoration wall. The wall is covered with vines allowing us to climb. We have to avoid falling rocks as we do in a callback to Death Mountain. At the top, we find a cave that is home to Patch. He agrees to fix the tuning nut, but only if we participate in a special trap, uh, ceremony. The trap, uh, ceremony is a minigame. I found it super frustrating. Patch takes us to a room with a minecart track running around the outside. There is a hole in each corner of the inside of the track, and a floor switch on the northern end of the room. Patch places the tuning nut on the tracks. The floor switch operates a rail switch which will prevent the minecart from hitting the nut. We need to hit four hard hat beetles into the holes while preventing the minecarts from hitting the nut. It took me many tries to get things right. I found that using Rock's Feather to jump over the beetles and get them all grouped together really helped. After getting the nut repaired, we can return to Symmetry City quickly thanks to a shortcut just outside Patch's cave. Returning the Tuning Nut restores balance to the city. Traveling to the future again, we find that Symmetry City is still standing. There's green grass on the ground. Lava no longer flows from the volcano. Instead, water flows down the sides. And a door is now visible on the side of the volcano. Through the door, we find the fourth dungeon of the game, the Skull Dungeon. True to its name, the Skull Dungeon is shaped like a skull. It's split between two floors, one ground level, one basement level. The full picture of the dungeon is split between both floors. The first floor makes up the bulk of the picture. It's a skull from the top of the head to the top jaw. There's no nose socket, but empty rooms on the map make the eyes. 
The basement floor is shaped like the lower jaw. Because the dungeon is shaped like a skull and heavily features lava, naturally for a volcano, it reminds me of Death Mountain from the original Legend of Zelda. The music features a moody, rising and falling melody. It's appropriate for a dark dungeon theme, but it also strikes me as sounding kind of Russian, or at least Russian in the sense that the Tetris theme is Russian. This classic Tetris theme was composed by longtime Nintendo composer Hirokazu Tanaka. According to an article on Wikipedia, it's inspired by a Russian folk song. The Skull Dungeon theme does not share a melody with the Tetris theme, but it does strike me as having a similar vibe. If Tetris is the bright and happy side of the Russian music that inspired it, Skull Dungeon is the darker side. It would be at home in a seedy bar where you could get stabbed at any moment. I dig it. The dungeon is divided into two distinct parts, split between the floors. There are a number of mechanics from past dungeons that reappear here. There are dice with different colored sides that we must push into the right location. There are color changing panels that we have to jump over. There are mine carts. There are moving platforms we have to jump between. New in this dungeon is lava and switches that we can pull to make the lava temporarily cool and turn to stone. The first of these is found in the right cheekbone. It's easy enough to navigate. There's a block that looks like it could be pushed for a shortcut, but that's just a red herring. We pull the switch, watch as the lava turns to stone, and then quickly cross the cooled lava to continue on in the dungeon. If we don't move fast enough, the stone will melt and form into lava again. The second of these lava obstacles is the hardest. It's one of two located in the left cheekbone. I struggled to get across, trying again and again. I was using a FunLab Firefly Switch Pro controller, and after what felt like my hundredth try, I decided to change which controller I was using. I switched to a Power A GameCube style controller, and I was able to get across with that controller. You need to have a responsive controller, otherwise you won't make it. Another new mechanic introduced here are rooms covered in color-changing floor tiles. The tiles change when they are walked over. The idea is to change every tile in the room, but there are statues placed throughout the room that mean players need to plan their moves carefully so that they can get across the entire room and change every tile in a single walkthrough. We find the dungeon item in one of these rooms, located right in the center where a nose would be, if this skull had one. The item is the switch hook. It's a play on the hookshot from past games. Instead of pulling Link towards objects, it causes him to switch locations with those objects. We use the switch hook to cross gaps just as we would with the hookshot, but we also use it to move objects onto switches or as an alternate method to lift pots. The mini-boss of this dungeon is an Armos Knight. It's a different fight from the one that we've seen in past games. This knight throws a sword. The sword will follow Link around the room. We have to position the knight between us and the sword so that the sword will hit the knight, eventually destroying its sword and shield. Once they break apart, the knight begins to charge Link and we must hit it with our sword. It falls fairly quickly once we start doing this. I thought it was a pretty fun fight and not too hard. We get the boss key on the left side of the skull just above the eye, and then we use the switch hook to move along the right eye and enter the basement level of the dungeon. This lower level is more straightforward. We clear a room of slime enemies which camouflage themselves to match the color of the floor, and we solve a color changing tile room and do a little platforming before we head in to face the final boss. The boss is called Eyesore. That's S-O-A-R as in flying. It's a large eye with wings that surrounds itself by smaller eyes with wings. It's a very clear callback to the Patra mini boss from the original game. There are fewer eyes to deal with and the switch hook is required to defeat the boss. At first I tried to approach it like Patra and destroy the small eyes first, but Eyesore immediately regenerates new small eyes. So instead, we just need to get between the small eyes and then grab the large eye with the switch hook. This causes it to fall to the ground and spin. We can then land hits with the sword. This is another boss where I came extremely close to dying, but I managed to defeat it before it defeated me. After defeating the boss, we can collect the heart container and the next essence. It's the burning flame. We're told this essence reignites wavering hearts with a hero's passion.
The Maku tree then directs us to the ridge north of Nehru's house. We'll head there next week. If you want to follow along, please subscribe. And a big thank you to everyone who has subscribed already. I really do appreciate you liking what I'm doing on this podcast. I'm Paul Riley, and I will see you next week. <laughs>